Hi, this is Greg from Structural Toolkit. And in this video, we're going to go through a steel end plate connection design for a residential brace frame. Once you've analyzed and designed the members of your brace frame, you can use the member forces with the end plate design module to design your bolts, plate, and also get a weld force. The end plate module references the Australian Institute of Steel Constructions Design of Structural Connections handbook, published in 1994 and is often referred to as the Green Book, where it provides guidance on methods to determine the resultant plate, bolts and weld forces for various end plate connection types. We do note that the Australian Steel Institute have subsequently released a newer connection series based on the American ASI design guides and takes a significantly different design approach, which you may like to review. In their method, the end plate is based around a thick plate model using yield line theory with no prime effects by limiting the end plate capacity to 90%. Going back to talking about the green book, it then outlines various ways to determine the capacities of the plate, bolts, and welds. These capacities are in accordance with AS4100 and the significant amount of research done on the topic in Australia and other parts of the world. The end plate design module in Toolkit covers type A and B connections and will check the bolts for tension and shear and the end plate for moment. A weld force is also calculated based on the section type selected, which can be checked against the reference or welds modules on the desktop. The end plate module doesn't cover tension, compression or shear stiffener design. This is covered in the portal knee connection design module if needed and it is something we will look at in another video. An important thing to know about this connection type is that it is assumed to be a rigid connection as outlined by the green book. This means that 8.8 .8 snug tighten bolts are not applicable, being typically used for flexible connections such as cleat or flexible end plates. The method therefore requires fully tensioned 8.8 .8 TB or 8.8 .8 TF bolts. Typically you'll go with TB bolts as tension friction TF bolts require a high level of surface preparation of the joining members and these are only necessary in the situation where no slip is permitted under serviceability loads. So for this video's example we'll go through the end plate design of a simple residential brace frame for wind action. We've already set up our frame model in toolkits analysis, obtained our maximum member forces and checked our deflections. If you want to know more about setting up a brace frame in analysis have a look at our analysis light video. So after meeting our deflection criteria and arriving at a 200 PFC brace frame, we have also already used the member forces from analysis and checked the capacities of our members. And so what we would need to do now is look at our end plate design. It should be noted that because the governing criteria for a brace portal is generally deflection, it is not uncommon for the capacities to be significantly underutilized. Another thing we need to mention is that the green book states that only connections with four bolts around the tension flange are considered. However, the principles for using two per flange for a channel are similar. It is likely that this statement originates around the requirement for symmetry. Before we open up our end plate module, we'll want to first obtain our member enforcers from our analysis model. As we discussed, we've already set up the model with its restraints and loads. And so with it analyzed, we will just need to find the maximum forces to then take into our end plate design. Now, depending on the way you intend to connect your end plate, the forces you will need to obtain may differ. For the design model used, we will need to take the forces from the member that the end plate is going to be welded to. Two examples of this are where the end plate is welded to a beam or rafter, which is then bolted onto the side of a column. However, sometimes depending on space limitations, you may instead end up with a scenario where the end plate is welded to the top of the column and bolted into the underside of a beam. This often is the case with brace frames that also form part of upper floor framing. In the first case, we will want the member end forces from the beam. And in the second case, we will want the end forces from the column. For our example, we'll be adopting the former. Our critical combination case is 0.9 dead load plus wind load. And so we'll be obtaining all our forces using this combination. Depending on your design, this will vary and you'll need to consider the range of combination types possible. Looking at just our bending moment diagram, we can see that we have our maximum moment at the left side. And with shear, this also being the case, giving us a maximum moment of 10.97 kilonewton meters and then 7.24 kilonewtons for shear. Finally, if we look at our axial forces, 
we find our force to be 3.94 kilonewtons in compression. These forces are at the center line of the connection, so you may want to take these at the connection face. One way of doing this is using the result points feature. So moving on to the end plate module, we'll first open up one from the desktop. So for this module, we'll start with our forces. But we also need to specify the moment capacity of our beam, being the member that is welded to the end plate. The default value here is the MSX of the selected section. So if we choose our PFC, we can see an MSX value of 59.7 kilonewton meters. But this isn't always the true moment capacity. You will need to refer to the member design you performed to work out what this is, which would consider the segment length adjacent the end plate and the moment distribution in the segment. So if we open up our steel member design that we have done earlier, we can see we have a moment capacity in BX of 59.7 kilonewton meters, where we've taken the segment length to be the entire length of the member with an alpha M of 2.5. So as our capacity MBX does actually equal MSX in this case, we can go back to the end plate design module and leave our MBX input as the default. This is often a very important value for this design as AS4100 specifies that for rigid construction, our end plate connection needs to be designed for at least 0.5 times the bending moment capacity. And so if your portal frame is critical for deflection, you may not have a design moment from your model that exceeds half the moment capacity, meaning that your connection design moment will be determined by this. As outlined in the handbook, the intention behind this requirement is to have a guaranteed minimum design capacity with some inherent robustness. If we remember, our bending moment for our model was 11 kN meters, so we can put that in here. We had 3.9 kN in compression, and as this input is positive for tension, we will need to put it in as needed. It's useful to know here that a compression force will reduce the design forces for the bolts and end plate capacity checks. So a conservative approach in this case might be to ignore it. However, do remember that this isn't the case for shear and compression stiffener requirements along with welds. As for these checks, a compression force may result in a higher design force. Next we have our shear force, which if we recall is 7.2 kN. Like the design moment, the design shear is also not only based on our shear input. Although AS4100 does state that the minimum shear force specified is only required for connections of simple construction, that is connections that do not develop or transfer bending moments, the design model from the handbook does suggest that a minimum shear force of 40 kN might be used being the same value found in clause 9.1.4b of AS4100. The code also includes a value of 0.15 times the member shear capacity, where out of the two of these values, the minimum is to be taken. Based on this, the module in toolkit will take the minimum of 0.15 BVM and 40 kilonewtons. It will then take the maximum of the design shear force inputted and the minimum value found from clause 9.1.4b. We can see to the right some details on the shear capacity and also the 0.15 VVM calculation, where in our case we have 31.1 kN. The final input in the design action section is the member pitch. This will determine whether the end plate type is A or B and will calculate the result forces accordingly, as we will see later. For our model, our pitch is zero. If we now look below, we can see the calculated design moment in shear which in our case has been set to the minimum design actions from AS4100, which will often happen when designing a brace frame for deflection as we did. Based on our design actions, the forces are then resolved into the components required for design. The formulas used to resolve these forces are from table 4.8.2.2 of the handbook. The derivations and assumptions behind these formulas are relatively straightforward. The first force is the design force in the tension flange, which will be used in our bolt and plate design along with our weld force. Our next force is the design force in the compression flange, which for this design module isn't used, but calculated for completeness. These two forces are calculated based on the first moment, which creates a force couple in the flanges, having a lever arm from the center to center of these flanges. We can see this component in the equation here. Adding to this is the axial force, which is divided between the two flanges. Note that if you have an unequal section, there are extra provisions for the distribution of this axial force. 
but this isn't covered in this end plate module. Now, depending on the type of end plate connection, these forces may need to be resolved into the correct axis based on the pitch input. In this case, the shear will also form a component of this force. The design shear force is then just the total shear force for type A, or resolved into the correct axis for type B, where it also includes an axial force component. The next section is for our connections geometry. A lot of these inputs will typically depend on the member size you're using for the connection. The first input is our end plate thickness, which will come into the end plate design down below. A common way to go about this is to specify an end plate thickness that matches the bolt diameter. The Green Book also recommends as a rule of thumb to use a thickness somewhere between 1 to 1.2 times the bolt diameter. For our 200 PFC connection, we'll try and get M16 bolts to work. So we'll start by also putting in a 16 mil end plate in here. The next input is our end plate width. A suitable value here would be our rafter flange width, which is indicated to the right. So we'll go with 75 mils. We'll use a plate with a yield stress of 250 MPa. Note that grade 250 and 300 plate are specified in AS4100 table 2.1. However, we will use the grade 250, which can be more readily available. As discussed, we'll also have our bolt size be 16 mils and use grade of 8.8. .8. This module does support grades 10.9 and 4.6, noting that grade 4.6 is not recommended and grade 10.9 includes a ductility factor reduction for shear through the threads as outlined in AS4100. We then have our number of bolts, which will have a significant effect on the design capacities as we will see later. Various arrangements are supported and the default input will change depending on your selected section. For example, a UB will default to 4 bolts per flange, whereas a PFC will default to 2. This module also supports having bolts outside the flange. The handbook doesn't cover this design model and as we will see later, it requires extra consideration of how the forces will distribute into the bolts when they are not arranged symmetrically around each flange. Where two bolts to the outside of each flange are specified for a PFC, you will require stiffeners at each flange like shown to the right here. This is to ensure the forces in the flange are equally distributed to the bolt, keeping it in line with the design assumptions of this method. For our example, we'll keep it a standard two bolts to each flange with one inside and one outside, as we can see in the input here. Next is the center line of the bolt to the face of the flange. There are various ways a suitable value can be determined as outlined in the green book. This module offers a recommended distance based on the bolt diameter, which we'll adopt being 45mm for 16mm bolts. The larger the distance, the more bending will be induced into the end plate. Finally, we have the prying factor. The prying factor is to account for the additional prying forces applied at the edge of the end plate, resulting in an actual bolt force greater than that of the force in the flange. We can see the mechanism of this on this diagram where the applied tensile force will pull the plate up and the deflected plate will apply additional prying forces at the edge. This then results in additional forces in the bolt. The amount of prying forces is related to the stiffness and deflection of the plate, but other mechanisms such as yielding of the plate or fasteners may come into play, and so it isn't a simple correlation in this case. Based on various research and testing, the handbook suggests that a suitable prime factor would be in the range of 0.2 to 0.33 for this type of connection. The module in Toolkit recommends 0.2 to 0.3. For our example, we'll be using 0.3. With all our inputs covered, we can now move on to our design capacity calculations. First section is the bolt design, where we'll check the tensile and shear capacities and also the combined ratio. The first check is the tensile capacity where the actual force per bolt needs to be determined. Now depending on if the bolts are symmetrically around the flange or just on the outside, the lever arm of the bolt group would either be the same as the flange or slightly longer. In this second case, the force is ratioed down to account for this as we can see here. In our case, the lever arms are the same. So this part of the equation has no effect. The total force is then divided by a number of bolts at the tension flange being two which gives us our force before prying, which in our case is 78.4 kN. Calculation below then takes this force and multiplies it to include prying, giving us 101.9 kN. The capacity of the bolt is based on clause 9.2.2.2 from AS4100, which is the tensile stress area multiplied by the tensile strength with a capacity factor of 0.8. From this calculation, we get 104 kN. The next check is the bolt shear capacity 
The bulk design shear force is just the design shear force divided by the number of bolts. The capacity is then based on clause 9.2.2.1, where it is based on the tensile strength and the bolt core area, as the shear plane intercepts the threads. Four grade 10.9 bolts that intercept the shear plane, an additional reduction factor KRD is required, with it being set to a value of 0.83 as specified. The publication High Strength Structural Bolt Assemblies to ASNZS 1252-2016 by the Australian Steel Institute gives the derivation of this factor from EN 1993-18 being 0.833. Finally, we have the combined check from clause 9.2.2.3. After the bolt design, we then have the end plate. Firstly, we need to determine the moment in the plate. The design model here assumes that the axial force in the flange transferring to the bolts will result in double curvature bending of the plate. From this, we can determine the moment in the plate by multiplying the force in the bolts on the outside of the flange, multiplied by half the distance between the center line of the bolts to the outside of the flange. As you can probably understand, having bolts on just the outside of the flange will result in a greater plate moment than having them both on the outside and inside. Something we also need to consider with this model is that research has suggested that the bolt force does not act at the center of the bolt. As a result of flexural deformations in the end plate, the bolt force acts somewhere between the bolt axis and the edge of the bolt head. Based on this, an approach to determining the effective design distance for the moment calculation is AFE equals AF minus DF2, which effectively reduces the lever arm by half the bolt diameter. Alongside this is the recommendation that the edge distance from the center of the bolt is no more than 1.25 times AF. We do note that the green book approach for the plate ignores the prying effects we took into consideration with the bolt design. Additional information on this approach is outlined in the green book. Using this effective distance, a plate moment is calculated, which works out to be 1.45 kilonewton meters in our case. Above this, there are a few other geometry tricks which will provide warnings regarding the geometry of your connection and also provide recommendations. With our moment calculated, the end plate capacity is then determined below. The handbook does provide various methods to determine the capacity of the plate being based on research. Some of these methods are often only based on axial loads. The method this module adopts is based on the AS4100 method of moment capacity determination using clauses 5.2.1 and 5.2.3, where an effective section modulus is calculated and multiplied by the yield strength and a capacity factor of 0.9. The effective section modulus is the lesser of 1.5 times the elastic modulus and plastic modulus, which for a rectangular plate works out to be BD squared on 4. This gives us a capacity of 1.08 kilonewton meters which we can see does not meet our design force, so we'll need to reconsider our plate thickness shortly. To the top right of this section, we then get the weld force in our tension flange, which is based on the tension flange perimeter for which a weld can be applied. You can then use this number to check against the capacity of fillet welds if chosen, using the welds or reference modules. If a full strength butt weld is to be used, then this is required as per AS4100 clause 9.6.2.7. Finally, at the bottom, we then have some details about our selected section. As we can see from the various checks we've done, our specified geometry and bolts are satisfactory bar our plate. What we can try instead is a 20 millimeter plate, which makes our design satisfactory. As we discussed earlier, often having a bolt diameter that is the same as the plate thickness is adopted, but as outlined in the green book, 1 to 1.25 times the bolt diameter is another recommended approach, which in our case our 20 millimeter plate falls within this recommended boundary. We can then see a summary of our results at the top, where our utilization ratios for the bolts and plate are shown to the right. At this point, we would check that our flange weld sizes are satisfactory and do a check of the web weld to transfer shear force. With those done, our connection check would be complete and we can move on to the next part of the design which may be checking the base pullout of our portal frame. That about covers all you need to know for designing a rigid end plate connection in Toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching. 